evident that he cares. What do you care about? Welcome to The Rock Newman Show. It's The Rock Newman Show. beloved i am rock newman and you're about to watch another segment of the rock newman show 2.0 i want to say to uh all of you that uh are tuning in um i should say this every show and i haven't that i am most appreciative that with as much as going on in the world and as busy as i know all of you must be that you take the time to support us to like what we do, to share what we do, to subscribe to our channel. We're just under 200,000 subscribers now. And needless to say, that's all because of you spreading, spreading the word. I love to hear your and read your comments. Most often I read all, all of them the ones that are most critical, the ones that are most laudatory. So it is you that makes literally the Rock Newman Show. So I wanted to thank each of you who, who might be tuning in now. Um, I am really excited about bringing you today's guest. When I did the show at WHUT TV, that's Howard University Television, um, right here in Washington, D.C. I actually had a script and that script was part of the script was I hope to inspire you with extraordinary stories and example of achievement. And I want you to really kind of listen in here and to pay attention because the more that I have gotten into this book that I'm about to introduce you to. The book's name is Rosa Parks, Beyond the Bus, Life, Lessons, and Leadership by my guest today, H.H. H. Leonard. It is an honor to have you sitting at my table. I adore Thank you. you. And I say my table, look, you all see that this is a much <laughs> different background than what I normally do. It is because I am doing it from her establishment where Rosa, it was, this was Rosa Parks home for her home away from home for many years. And she and H.H. H. Leonard became extraordinarily close. And we want to talk about the experiences that H, her, everyone knows her as H that H had with Rosa Parks. But I want to say to you, in the event you've never heard of the O Street Mansion, do that old fashioned thing and Google it. Look for it, the O Street Mansion, the O Street Museum. It is, and maybe if I speak in any way incorrectly, please feel free to jump in and correct me. But it is a hotel it is a museum. It is a place where you, when you enter, you're lifted. It is so special. It is called by publications, legitimate publications all over the world as perhaps the single most interesting place in the world. And to many of you, it's still unknown. I want you to come here and see the splendor, see the history, meet H and enjoy yourself. So that's why you see a much different background 
here today. And when I say that I bring up my old script, I want to inspire you with stories and examples of extraordinary inspiration. Here's what I mean. I want to start this program this way. I know her and I've known, I've known H for a very long time. And I know that she's too modest to do what I'm about to do, but I'm going to do it. So here we go. She says, many people have asked how I established the mansion and O Street Museum, especially because I started with no money, no business background, and no art or design background. It started simply with a childlike openness to do the vis openness to the visions of God pass through me. I look, it's rare that I read stuff. We just talk, but I got to do this. My first job in Washington, D.C. was as a nanny for seven children. Seeing our nation's capital through the eyes of these children was wonderful, enlightening, and life-changing. I have loved all of my various jobs. Listen, working at a girls' reformatory as a hospital assistant, that's a nice way of saying I was a bed, a, a, a bed pan cleaner. As a dishwasher, as a mental hospital caretaker, a waitress, a short order cook, secretary, and working with severely handicapped children. Every job has contributed to my ability to balance vision with practical ways to get things done. She goes on to say she graduated in the bottom 10% of her high school, of her high school class. I wanted you to hear that and I wanted you to feel that because wherever you are on in the spectrum of your life, this is an extraordinary example of how with very little, what seems to have, be very little that you have, you can become a giant and that you can create masterpieces. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me today in your house. Thank you for that introduction. I am blushing. But I think the most important thing is what you just said. Anyone can do what I've done. And anyone can become Mrs. Rosa Parks. Because she started with nothing. Her entire life she had nothing. Anything she got monetarily she gave back to those who were in greater need than she was. So we're in this together. We can do this together. You can start movements. You can create your vision into a reality for other people. And that's the key. If you're serving other people first, you can become Mrs. Parks. You know, um, I, read, I read this book. And folks, I want to suggest that you get this book, Rosa Parks, Beyond the Bus. You know, we see the memorials that were, that was done for her, um, you know, that were thing that, that, that her actions were publicized, but there's such a deeper person there. There's such a deeper lesson there. And they're captured in this book, Beyond the Bus. Um, and it is a wonderful and easy read, and it's got such personal touch to it, real life examples of a bonding and of a friendship. And you know what? I want to I want to mention I want to mention this. And that is uh H.H. Leonard is someone that would be characterized as a Caucasian. And much too often, we 
experience and there is the suggestion about the lack of appreciation that Caucasians have for African Americans. Just, I want to just put that out there. And here is a, here is a book where a humility by H comes through to acknowledge the giantness of a Rosa Parks. What inspired you to write this book? The Library of Congress was doing a, their first exhibit on one person in their 200 year uh, history. Library of Congress. Library uh -huh. of Congress. Mm -hmm. And they were going through her papers and they came across pictures of us and they didn't know I existed. They did not know Mrs. Parks had lived here for nearly 10 years. And they came and asked me if I would write a book about her. And I said to them, I, Mrs. Parks' time here was private. I promised her I wouldn't tell anyone. And they looked at me and burst out laughing and they said, Hey, you have to understand that you're the only person that can write this book, not the history of her, but her heart and what her soul is. And she's passed and we give you permission to write this book. And that's really how it happened. But they said, you have to have it finished in four months because our exhibit opens. Oh my God. And in my mind, I thought I was going to write a children's book and I thought I can do this. So I said yes. And I shook their hand and thanked them. And, um, that's how it evolved. I want to come back to Rosa Parks, but for those that are looking in, I want you to be aware of something when I talk about the magnitude of this place, how absolutely extraordinarily impressive. Th what, how do you bet, how, what's your favorite way of describing the O Street Mansion and all you have here? What's your best way of describing that? It's all part of the village and the community. Everything is donated here. It's not about me. I'm here to help other people serve other people. And we're a sanctuary of spirit and hope in the creative process. That when people come here, when they leave, they understand that anything is possible if you dare to be different. And if you understand that there's a purpose that God has given you to live and become his servant. I think that's so important. Okay, some of the information that I know of, and I'm not going to say if I got it from H or not, <laughs> but, but I know of it, is Prince used to love this place. Prince would come here. He would stay here. He would come at 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning and just release himself and become himself. And play, and, and play. You want to know who else? Lenny Kravitz. Lenny Kravitz. I don't know whether you can say this or not, because I know you are really sworn to being protected, but Lenny Kravitz had like his, one of his very first performances here. Um, the Eagles. Esper, what, how do you pronounce it? Esperanza Spaldi. The these people love this place. My good friend, who we affectionately refer to as Mayor for Life, Marion Barry, during much of the turmoil of his life, this was his and the First Lady's core, Barry. This was kind of an escape for them. Now, I know personally ab about, about that. Um, so... When I discovered it, I had no idea that anything like this existed. And folks who come in here from around the world, they characterize it as the one of the most interesting establishments. Some has written that it is the most interesting establishment in the world. I want to, someone that I was extraordinarily close with, uh, H, was Dick Gregory. Can I have your reflections on Dick Gregory? He was a beautiful soul and he liked to be anonymous and he would come in here and hold hands with Mrs. Parks and they would have private conversations. And like when you reached out and held my hand twice when you became, began our interview, 
he had the ability like you do to pass thoughts through his hands like Mrs. Parks did. Those are powerful people that are givers to the world. And I think what makes you one of my favorite people on the planet is people know who you are. They know who you've done, but it's your heart that comes out on your sleeve. Every, every word you speak <laughs> when you meet people, you, you're, you serve others. You, you see it. the bigger vision. You're, and you're. it's so rare. Yeah. And I think that's why you have so many followers, because they feel that. Mm. And that's... Now, now you're making me blush. I want to find this piece that talked about uh, Mrs. Rosa Parks and being uh, being a servant. I know. So Reverend Jesse Jackson is quoted as saying this. The mansion was Mrs. Parks home away from home where I visited with her many, many times like the 80 plus secret doors there. I told y'all this place is <laughs> it's off the charts, y'all. Leading to stunning rooms throughout the mansion. Miss Leonard's book opens doors into the innermost thoughts of Miss Rosa Parks. Sometimes sad, sometimes joyful, but always insightful. So if I could <clears throat> please ask you to take us through the beginning of your relationship with her. And I certainly want you to share the most important lesson or lessons that you took from her. That will take hours. Yes. She was so extraordinary. But I'll start with how she came to stay with us. Okay. Uh, since our inception, February 14th, 1980, we've had a Heroes and Artists in Residence program where people stay here for free. Um, we don't publicize it, it's word of mouth. And when Mrs. Parks was severely assaulted in her home in Detroit at the age of 81, um, she was in the hospital. If you Google her, she w went to the emergency room and she was went home right away. But the real story is she was so badly assaulted that her pacemaker was dislodged. She was there for weeks, but she was of sound mind and body to make everyone in the hospital sign non-disclosure agreements. So no one knew she was there. And she said she didn't want the children of the world to think that they could be assaulted in their home like she was with the Klan in Alabama. And that's why she did that. She tells you who she was always Oh my goodness, I've been um, in a horrible shape. It was, I'm going to protect other people. Um, so I got a call from Willis Edwards, who was the head of the NAACP in Beverly Hills. I did not know who he was, but I, he told me that Mrs. Parks had been assaulted and she had no money. She refused adamantly to ever go back into her home again in Detroit. Could she come and stay with us for free as part of our HEROES program? Mm. I did not know who Mrs. Parks was. I grew up in Indiana. We yeah. got no history. Yeah. But from his need and his voice, I said, absolutely, yes. Mm. And that's how she came. I did not Google her before she came. I did not ask anybody. The one thing I was asked was not to tell anyone she was staying with us. It was private. Yeah. Um, when she came, they rolled her in. There were five people that stayed with her also to care for her around the clock. Hmm. Um, they, she came in a wheelchair and she reached up her hand weakly from the wheelchair and I felt her and I instantaneously my life changed. It was like, ah. but it was three years before anyone told me who she was and it was not her team that told me. It was somebody else that was here. So you, so. I had even no though idea. You, did, you didn't research her before she came here, and even she was here did not. for three years before you really looked up who she was. Yeah, well, I looked it up only because someone else told me that said, do you know who that's sitting over there talking to guests here? And I said, yeah. yes, it's Mrs. Rosa Parks. And he said, H, I know you. Do you know what she did? And I went, no, I just love her. And then he told me, and I was humiliated. I mean, I was really, truly humiliated that I didn't know. Yeah. And I apologized to her um, that evening. And she d didn't say anything right away. She held my hand, and she said, um, it's okay. You shouldn't be embarrassed. But I think it was God's way. Because if you had known who I was, we wouldn't have the relationship 
that we have. You felt who I was inside, not what I've done. I trusted you because so many people have used my fame for their own gain, and that's why I'm still here. And then she paused, and she looked at me, and she went, but Lady H, what took you so long? <laughs> and then she said, could you start traveling with me? So mm. at that point, I got to travel with her um, and listen to her talk about what she'd done and answer questions. But the seven years after that, I never asked her any historical question. It wasn't our relationship. Mm -hmm. Our relationship was about God, mission, vision, serving other, and family. And that's what she anchored her life around. Her whole mission was civil rights, women's rights, human rights, but it was really love. Love was all that matters. And if she could get that concept out to other people, the world would be a better place. And I think she is remembered today when the politicians aren't because it was her message of love and hope that is eternal. And people need to hear that. And that's why I'm a very um, shy person, but I'm going around the world talking about Mrs. Parks. And I can do that because I'm talking about her and what the lessons that I learned for her, which were extraordinary. But I didn't learn them right away. She would have to tell me over and over again what they were to have them sink as deeply as they have. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the Library of Congress asked me to write the book that I understood the depth of what she was teaching. And I say to everybody out there, write down what you're experiencing. Keep a journal. Because when you look back at that journal, you'll understand your life is extraordinary. Everybody's life is extraordinary. And that's another thing Mrs. Parks taught me. You know, it is perhaps, Rosa Parks perhaps represents, she was slightly built, you know, certainly in her later years, frail. And I'm telling you something. I recently have seen a video that Dick Gregory was captured on and he was out of his brain angry at Cedric the Entertainer and the language that he used in one of the movies and you could see it had touched a nerve with Greg where as wonderful and as funny and all of those things that he could be, he was flat out angry. And it was of it, the, what, what Cedric the Entertainer did in the movie. You know, he said something very, that would be construed as very disrespectful about Mrs. Parks. And I am hearing you now. I am just, it is just really resonating with me as you explain him coming by and touching her and holding her hands. It is just resonating with me now why he was so angry. Because I was about to say, she's a small lady, but it's an example how a small, quiet, person can be such a giant because she was such a giant. What people don't know about her is in the 1930s, she was documenting rape victims in Alabama, both men and women. I want you, that, folks, I want you to listen. I, I, I want you to listen. I, I so much wanted to do this show there is so much attached to it. There's so much relevance. There's so much importance. And I'm going to ask you to say that again because y'all think about Rosa Parks and you think about the time that she didn't give up her seat on the bus. 1930, she was doing what? She was documenting rape victims in Alabama, both men and women, so that they would have a voice. Someone would listen to them. Someone would hear them. Someone would have compassion and empathy for what they were suffering. And she did that all throughout her life. 
And the passage that I was looking for here, I lost the page, but I don't really think I need it. It is the passage that talks about her being the example of a servant leader that leads Rosa Parks, that led throughout her life, led through servants. I heard uh, Mr. Uh, Louis Farrakhan give a speech and he said the greatest leader is the greatest servant. And if that is the description, if that's, if that's an accurate description, now I understand what he's saying and I buy that. What a leader she was. A little known fact about Mrs. Parks was that um, she asked Reverend Farrakhan to speak at her funeral years before she passed. Mm -hmm. She had great respect for him mm -hmm. um, from his heart. Mm -hmm. And people that were at the funeral, because I was a pallbearer at all three of her funerals, but the one in Detroit where he spoke, they went, oh, mm -hmm. he had everyone in his hands. It was the most extraordinary speech I think I've ever heard. Wow. And if anyone wants to listen to that, go to C-SPAN, Mrs. Parks' funeral, Farrakhan. Um, his cadence, the words he talked about for love and yeah. why she was the woman she was. Yeah. Even the way you talk is so much like him because it was like you feel in your guts the words that are being spoken, the poetry. But she was... Um, People think that she was meek and quiet, but mm -hmm. she belonged to the Black Panther movement. Yeah. Malcolm X was one of her heroes. Yeah. Um, she, but she knew how to maneuver, so she was the only person that I'm aware of that was a Black, power, Black, Black Panther that the FBI never has a file on her. Mm -hmm. That's extraordinary leadership. Yeah. Um, people don't know that she helped found now. Um, National Organization of Women. Yes, and the only person that gives her credit for found, founding that was Anna Hegeman, who said that it was Mrs. Parks's idea, and it wasn't just her idea. It was her behind the scenes making sure that it happened, and they wanted to make her president. And Mrs. Parks said, no, this is about all the women's movements. And this is about coming together. If I'm your president, it will only be about civil rights. We yeah. need to be inclusive. Yeah. That shows an authentic leader. It's not about having her credited for that. Oh, yeah. It's making sure things happen. Yeah. So, um, do, do, do you, <laughs> I think this was Detroit, where the preacher, Reverend Adams, he said, oh, Lord, I want to thank you. And then he said it, he said it, um, he said it in multiple languages. If I was, uh, if I, if I was Hebrew, he said, well, however you say thank you now. If I was Korean, I would say it that way. If I was Spanish, I'd say merci beaucoup, or what, whatever. And he said, if I was deaf, I'd say. <laughs> and what she brought out if, if you, like you, you, you talked about Minister Farrakhan, but what she brought out in the respect that she so kindly and gently commanded through a life of service, you could see during those funerals, the impact and an articulation of who she was. Now, I'm so happy that you did this book because I want people to just know her essence. And I think here, you absolutely capture her essence. You capture you all's relationship. I know you said when you met her and she held your hand, your life changed. What is it that if you had, if you were put under the gun like I'm doing right now, putting you under the gun, to say how most did she and her example change your life? Um, never lose sight of your mission or your vision. You have to seize every moment that God gives you um, to speak the truth, 
no matter how much at the moment it might hurt you. You need to speak up. Um, I'll tell you a story about um, when President Clinton was um, the Mon Monica Lewinsky Scandal, yeah. And it was just before the State of the Union address, and Mrs. Clinton asked Mrs. Parks to sit next to her during that. The Republicans and Democrats during the speech, and if you look at the speech, it's a magnificent speech. No one clapped. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter who was in the audience. His yeah. cabinet members didn't clap. Yeah. Um, then he introduced Mrs. Parks, and everyone, Supreme Court, both sides of the aisle, stood up and clapped. It was unbelievable still today when I think about it the hair on my arm goes boom and we came back here and I said Mrs. Parks that must have been an incredible moment what was that like for you and she never spoke quickly she always thought so it was three or four mi minutes and then she looked up at me with these incredible clear eyes and said I'm so happy I helped my country was never about her. And if we embrace that philosophy, think about what we can do as a nature, nation. Come together, there are differences. We don't agree, no one agrees about anything, especially now, but we have these commonalities and that's what Mrs. Parks was able to point out to us. It's about our country, it's about God, it's about family, it's about leading an exemplary life so your mission doesn't get disrupted. Mm. Those were such important lessons. And she had to teach them to me over and over again. We mm -hmm. have to teach each other over and over again. And I think that's what's so important. Come together, give others hope. You know, um, <laughs> a, a wise guy told me one time, whatever I've done, whatever kind of conversation, he said, no, he said, no one to shut up. Well, I could shut up right now after what you just said there. I could shut up and consider this exchange, this interview as having been successful. Um, but I'm not going to do that. I, I'm, 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 I'm not going to do it because part of what I want to do is I want to have you to talk about what your vision has been for this absolutely splendid place you have here and to delve into some of those folks to let some of the viewers that might be watching who don't have the confidence that they need to make their vision turn their vision into a reality i just like for you to talk about the development of the old street mansion and all that it is, has been, represents in the vision for the future. So when I moved in here, I bought the house with credit card cash advances and I had no furniture. I had a few records because I love music and I had a few books. I love music. I slept on the floor. Um, I really didn't have money to eat. So we started asking people to bring potluck dinners. They brought a dish and everyone shared and we sat on the floor. And we started immediately with getting musicians from the street to perform here. Hmm. And they would come here for free and then they'd pass their hat and get some money and they'd eat the food that everyone had brought, everyone their dish. Mm -hmm. Those were extraordinary times. And in the, maybe I moved in in February 14th, 1980. And shortly after our first musician performed here, he said, I live in the street, I'm a Vietnam vet. Can I come and stay inside? Um, and then when it's, Spring, I'll go back on the streets again, which he did for three winters. He learned how to play the piano on a piano that had been donated to us with a little transistor radio. He was extraordinary. He's like a Bobby Short. And at the end of the three winters, I got him a job playing at a club in D.C. for $2,500 a month. He would still have to come here and get bathed, and we would put on his tuxedo. We'd walk him to the venue. Uh, he would still live on the street because he had his own issues, mm -hmm. but we were able to develop a talent and give back, and that's really the genesis of how the house started with our PTSD program. I didn't even know what PTSD was at the time, but I knew that I had wanted to help my country I had tried to join the Marines in my um, small town in Indiana, and that when the women had first gotten into the military, they said, lost my paperwork, so I came here to help my, my country. 
and that's what I've been doing every single day of my life. So the vision is to continue, um, continue with that, and also use the tools of technology to make everyone's life better. So next time you come in our safari room, when you pick up your phone, you're going to see an actual safari. And then you're going to walk through the augmented reality into the safari room and touch history that's in that room. Touch the books, touch the sculptures that come from Africa, touch the heart and soul of what our world is like. I'm tethered, I'm tethered to this microphone. <laughs> If I, if, I, if, I, if I were not tethered, I'd come over and grab you and hug you. Um, so I happen to be aware of something that you're doing. I know we don't want to let the cat out of the bag too soon, <laughs> but I think it is so impactful and that our viewers... I know we're going to do this again. At some point, we got to do this again also. This again. But our viewers, I, I, I just, I don't have enough discipline not to touch on this. You're working on a project that is called 51 Steps to Freedom. Would you mind telling us as much as you can about it without violating anything? So during the pandemic... I knew that we needed to do something to bring tourism back to D.C. And because of Mrs. Parks' vision and the stories that she told me, I knew there were so many hidden figures in Washington that people didn't know about. So we started working on this project to bring tourism back to Washington. And it uh, tells the stories of Washington, D.C. We started in Anacostia, which is a forgotten neighborhood in this great city of ours. And we go from Anacostia to Georgetown, around town, and back to Anacostia through augmented reality, which is where kids learn today. And it, the genesis also started when Cyril Neville performed here. And he wrote a song in the 1990s about Mrs. Parks. And he said his own children didn't know their history. This was just before the pandemic, a couple of weeks. But they knew every rap song that had ever been written, every melody, every lyric. So he wrote this song so they would know their own history. So the, the combination of that, um, we then, during the pandemic, went to New Orleans, recorded the song again, made his lyrics a little bit more contemporary. And um, we launched 51 Steps to Freedom. And this coming Thursday at Howard Theater, the city is going to announce the initiative. It's very exciting. It's very powerful. And it will give everyone in our nation and everyone in our great city a wealth of knowledge through doing fun things. It's not a normal tour. It's like souped up Disney. Yeah. It's going to be fun through your phone and through the music and integration of all those elements. It'll be hope. So... I had a conversation in preparation for this interview with my partner uh, and friend, Avis, and he's off, he's off screen here. There would be no Rock Newman show if it were not for Avis. Avis has been much the backbone of this broadcast. And we got to a point where we were reviewing marveling at Miss Parks and all that she's done. And, and then we got to the part where we were looking at who you are, from whence you came, sort of no one would have imagined from where you were cleaning bedpans to being this giant of an entrepreneur. I know you even like to be described that way, but to have what exists here in the midst of the nation's capital. And what Avis and I observed in a couple of other interviews and projects that we were doing, it was with some young folks. It was with high school students and you know, college students who seem to have a sense of entitlement that frankly annoyed <laughs> both of us. And so it was Avis that said, they 
they don't have H, they need H's hustle. Now, a lot of time when you say somebody, hey, somebody's out there hustling, you know, there's a negative connotation to that. And I say, bullshit. When you're hustling for the with the right purpose and the right vi vision, like Barry White would say, hustle on, hustle on. Where do you get that from? Very simple. Visions from God. And I am not being facetious, mm -hmm. but everything I do is from a vision that he gives me. And that's why I'm not smart. I'm not, uh, I work hard. I love what I do, but it's mm -hmm. really, he gives me the pictures and of what to do. And I make sure that his visions become real. And um, that's really the secret. And, you know, we know God can be defined many, 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 many ways. I'm, I'm going to bring up a controversial name. R. Kelly. One night I was 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, I was at the Georgetown Inn. I mean, Georgetown, uh, the, 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 the deli over there is where you could go get a late night breakfast or, or, or whatever. The Bowie Monger. <laughs> <laughs> the Bowie Monger is one of the places, but this here was more on, on, on Wisconsin. It was called the Georgetown something. So I'm sitting in there and I'm sitting at the counter and I realize just sitting below where I was, was R. Kelly and a group of his people and his manager. His manager was a, um, a big boxing fan. And R. Kelly didn't know who I was. And he kind of said to R. Kelly who I was. So we, we said hello. And I watched him out of the corner of my eye pretty much the whole time I was there. So he'd be engaged in a conversation. And he would just come out of that conversation and what was obvious into his own world. And he'd be like, so he was hearing music. R. Kelly is a, anything you think about all the stuff that has come up later, he is a musical genius. I agree. I agree. Like Mozart was a musical, a troubled man, but a musical genius. And it was unmistakable to me that a force beyond R. Kelly was, he'd write stuff down. He, he'd write stuff down on a napkin. He was hearing voices. Something was coming to him from a power that one would say was deep within him or outside of him. What is, I don't care what it is, but there are clearly some people that are connected and have themselves open to those kind of messages. And it sounds to me, H, without any of the traditional educational training ways that you get that from that voice that R. Kelly was getting it from. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you can feel that when you see people. Yeah. And Mrs. Parks, the, the other thing that she's went around and I was privy to listen to some of her meetings with people was how important it was to lead that exemplary life because R. Kelly, you got it right, he was a genius and the lyrics and the music that he wrote were so elevated, um, elevating, still are today and he just needed someone to hold his hand and have those words of wisdom um, that she gave so many other people. Got to ask you, in your, in, 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 here, in your book here, you speak about um, your son. What did becoming a mother, let's start he, here with that. What did becoming a mother mean to you? I was in bed for eight months in order to have him. So every day I was conscious that this was something I really wanted. And that when children, I call it pop out, they are their own person. And you can just give them love uh, for their entire life, which I've done. He is um, extraordinary to watch because he grew up here with Mrs. Parks. I was, I, I was going to get to that. Yeah, but go ahead. It was... Um, he Her was impact on him. It was huge. And he was very shy. So he wouldn't go and have a conversation with Mrs. Parks. He would sit under the table, which had a 
tablecloth and listen to her. And um, he was about seven or eight, and he was a rap fanatic. And he came to her and said, Mrs. Parks, I just heard Outlaw say nasty words about you. I think it's wrong. I feel, and she, Mrs. Parks said, Oh, Z, that's so nice of you to tell me. What did he say? And Z said, I can't tell you, Mrs. Parks. <laughs> yeah. And she said, Well, let me listen to the music. And he said, I can't listen to it because it's so horrible. And she said, Well, why don't you give me the music and I will, I will listen to it. So he went up to his room and brought her a little cassette. Um, with outcast's words about her, and she sued, and she lost in court several times, and um, she persisted because she felt it was wrong to depict her or anyone else with those words that Dick Gregory was so upset about. Disgraceful. Because, disgraceful, and she finally won, and the money that she won from outcast and the record company went to, not to Mrs. Parks, not to her pocket, but went to her Rosa and Raymond Parks um, uh, school in Detroit so that the kids benefited from that and the lessons that she learned but she wouldn't if you she forgave everyone everything but she never forgot and if she disagreed with you she didn't she was um, always never got angry but she made sure that her mission was followed so she was persistent and Johnny Cochran was the one that finally came in and got the case settled and and he he worked for free for Mrs. Parks, which is also says something about him. Here is a successful man that understood grace and helped other people. And my, law, my son today is a lawyer, I think, because of that uh -huh. and his, the influence Mrs. Parks had on him. Yeah. And he um, always takes on cases to serve other people. It's not about him. So she taught him a lot. He's still shy. <laughs> Folks, I hope that you are getting the message. And I think the message is about selflessness and what can be accomplished. How much of a leader that you come can become by example. Some of the shows that I have done, I really appreciate the feedback. What I'm going to say from the quote unquote, from the quote conscious community unquote, is that I think that some of you might have a disbelief that someone like an H even exists. There's been so much abuse. There's been so much racism. There's been so much hostility that so many have had to overcome where it's not a surprise that there's a hardened, extraordinarily jaded, sense of those people are like that and you know and you 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 stereotype we all stereotype we all do we all do our stereotypes why in the world coming driving over here did i hear the song that had lyrics that said not all angels have wings you had a nice coat on and you're very nicely dressed here, but you ain't got no wings, <laughs> but you're an angel. Oh, wow. And giving wow. us an insight and an understanding of the power of this little lady who is truly bigger than life. And you, you being an example yourself of what can be achieved from a, a, a humble, humble beginning is something that I go back to my script. Folks, I, 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 am, I really wanted to do this because if I was being true to myself 
and saying that I want to inspire you with examples of extraordinary success. Here is one of those, ex one of those humble examples. God bless you. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I got tears in my eyes. Man, oh man. Folks, again, I'm going to ask you to like, what am I supposed to say? Oh, like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you the next time. God bless you and have a great, great life. Welcome to the O Museum in the Mansion. We'll tell you all about our 10 glorious years with Mrs. Rosa Parks soon. But first, allow us to bring some context to your visit. We first opened our doors on Valentine's Day 1980. The way it was meant to begin, with a heart. Spanning five townhouses with over 100 themed rooms and 70 secret doors, the mansion is a fusion of all the arts as a museum, a concert and events venue, and a boutique hotel. But its higher purpose is what makes it truly unique. When founder H.H. H. Leonard bought the house with cash advances, credit cards, and a lot of prayers, she had a clear vision. She wanted to create a sanctuary, a special safe house for anyone who needed it. Founded in the belief that everyone has ability and need to be creative, the O Museum and the Mansion's overriding goal is to empower people to do what they love, to dare to be different, and to have fun. From heads of state to famous rock stars to regular folks like me and you, everyone has a place in the mansion. One of our most treasured supporters was civil rights activist Mrs. Rosa Parks. In 1955, she sparked a revolution by refusing to give up her seat on a segregated Alabama bus. The driver demanded that I give this seat up for a white man. I didn't feel that I was being treated as a human being. I refused to give up this seat. I said no, and I wouldn't give it up. From that moment, she became the mother of the civil rights movement. One evening, years later, H received a phone call from a friend saying Mrs. Parks had been attacked in her home in Detroit. And they heard about our Heroes and Artists in Residence program. Could she come and stay here when she got out of the hospital for a few days for free? She was here approximately 10 years, which is incredible. And that's how Mrs. Rosa Parks became part of our Heroes in Residence program. H wasn't the best student, so initially she had no idea who Mrs. Parks was, other than a wonderful person, of course. Over time, their bond grew stronger, and Mrs. Parks became a mentor and mother figure to age. I don't think we would have been as close if I had known. I would have been scared of her, or thought she was so, too important. Mrs. Parks loved entertaining friends at the mansion. She held formal gospel brunches where everyone wore a hat and white gloves, and nearly every year, on her birthday, she would hold fabulous tea parties. Lady H used to own a big yellow school bus. When Mrs. Parks had important meetings in DC, H would drive her there in the bus. Imagine this pulling up to the White House. Mrs. Parks always donned a huge childlike grin as they chugged along through the streets. This is her old room on three. During renovation, it was completely transformed. H found the bed before she got the inspiration for the room. You can see it here in the background, just waiting for the room to be built. And the lime green bathtub was replaced with a mahogany wooden tub. Mrs. Parks was the first person to stay in the room after it was created, and Lady H named it in her honor. The O Museum in the Mansion is now officially on the African American Heritage Trail, and rightfully so. She often stayed here with members of her Pathways to Freedom Foundation. In 1990, South Africa's anti-apartheid hero, Nelson Mandela, was released from prison. That same year, he flew to Detroit, specifically to meet Mrs. Parks. As he stepped off the plane, he was met with a long line of dignitaries instead. He scoured the crowd, spotted Mrs. Parks, and marched straight to her, chanting her name. 
The crowd called on, and soon thousands of people were chanting in unison. He hugged her and said, You sustained me in prison for all those years. It was a remarkable moment. A few years later, Mrs. Parks was invited to his birthday celebration, which she could not attend due to her age. Lady H went on her behalf and read her missive. This is what we have done, lifted ourselves up from the prisons of the world and let imagination and inspiration, our quest for equality, be the hope of others. In 1999, Mrs. Rosa Parks was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor the highest award a civilian can receive. The medal was designed by our very own artist in residence, Artist Lane. Mrs. Lane and Mrs. Parks were both from Detroit, both activists in their own right, and had been good friends for many years. Mrs. Lane even gave us a maquette she used for the medal. You can find it on the second floor. In 1999, Mrs. Parks was invited to meet the Pope in St. Louis. She took Lady H with her. On the way to meet him, Lady H helped Mrs. Parks craft a letter to read to the Pope. This picture shows Mrs. Parks reading out that very letter. Amongst other things, it said, The issue of racism still plagues our world. It is a cancer that has troubled me and others throughout my life. As a most respected, honoured and moral leader of this world, I ask your patience to address racism with your words and example. The next morning, Mrs. Parks and Pope John Paul II gave a joint press interview on racism in America. Later that day, Lady H asked why she had been invited to come, of all people, especially since she was white. Mrs. Parks turned to her and said, Oh dear, I didn't know you were white. Mrs. Rosa Parks passed away on the 24th of October 2005 in her Detroit apartment. Her body laid in state at the Capitol Rotunda, the first woman to have ever been given this honor. And so, even in death, she continued to challenge boundaries. H was a pallbearer at her funeral services in Montgomery, Alabama, Washington, D.C., and Detroit, Michigan. Southwest Airlines donated a plane and crew for transporting Mrs. Parks' casket to each city. Lady H, her husband Ted Sparrow, and their children, Z, Hannah, and Sonny, accompanied Mrs. Parks' body between the three funeral locations. Each of the children took one leg of the journey. It was a fitting way for the family to bid farewell to this wonderful lady. In 2013, Mrs. Parks became the first African-American woman to be honored with a life-size statue in the Capitol Rotunda. Lady H attended the dedication ceremony and hosted a reception at the mansion after the historic unveiling. Though Mrs. Parks is physically gone, her spirit continues to live on.